Dario introduced me. Um, I am an immigrant to Canada. I came from elsewhere, like many other people in Canada. I first came to Canada in 2002. Um, I got a PhD in the US. And at that time, uh, so, that, so I got educated in most of the 1990s in the US in graduate school. And then came here in 2002. At that time, um, progressive kinds of social work that paid attention to uh, differences, uh, power differentials uh, among people you work with, uh, was termed sort of in a sort of umbrella term in multicultural social work. Um, however, that was also concluded in that, it, that there are different ways of looking at it, uh, and power analysis was not always included, even though some of them had that as a central piece. <coughs> so, um, and definitely cultural literacy, cultural literacy model was in it. Um, so when I, uh, I think it was late 1990s when I was traveling in England, uh, and I casually went into a bookstore, this regular bookstore in the city corner of London or something, found a book, three bookshelves full. This is a regular bookstore. Three bookshelves full of social work books, and a few of them on the topics of anti-oppressive social work, anti-discriminatory social work, anti-racist social work. And I was so excited to see those titles. Um, not only having those titles available, but also in the middle of the city, um, that these books were just there, um, just next to English literature or philosophy or what have you. So I got uh, maybe 10 books from that. And that trip <laughs> and went home and, and started reading up on those titles. Um, and I, uh, so that was, I think, when I started thinking that, oh, maybe I should go to this Commonwealth countries. <laughs> uh, to study up on, uh, yeah, so an anti oppressive social work came into my vision. Um, and at that time, I thought that, oh, you know, multicultural social work sort of make it, uh, make it sort of fuzzy what you're working on. However, anti oppressive social work um, make it clear what we, are fi what we are working on. So, oppression is not, is something we do not want, and we want that out. It's it made it clear. So I like that um, clear um, approach back then. And um, however, uh, I, you know, I also wrote an article after that in 2005, that was published in 2005, that was written with Ron, Ron Pitner um, in, from British Journal of Social Work. Um, you know, they, this is a commonly uh, discussed uh, critic of anti-oppressive social work. Uh, the goal is too lofty. Can we ever get rid of oppression from our society? <coughs> Hope, uh, I wish, but probably difficult. Um, and this uh, no vision, like in terms of where to go to. Um, 70s feminism, for example, had utopia um, uh, science fiction. Um, and that is how to envisioning where we want to end up. So that's a good exercise to have. Often when we discuss among progressive social work type students, uh, what kind of society do you want to achieve? Uh, often it's anti, but not to. We don't have clear answers on where we want to end up. So that's something that I think somebody said earlier as well. You might not, was it you or John? Yeah, I think it was John. Yeah, so like anti. Um, and that was a question, uh, the, uh, difficulty of just not having a clear vision of where to. Um, and also when we are working from that mode, um, also you are like, oh, you're so uh, negative is what you often hear from your colleagues as well. And you might get burnt out. Uh, so, uh, and also you are always counter to something. You have to have dominance to have a counter. So you are always working against the counter culture mode, counter something mode and moving against uh, as opposed to moving forward, moving toward. So it would be good to have a vision of moving toward. So social justice, more than like, um, <laughs> Professor Sharman Leon suggested um, yesterday also comes to mind. And I would like to also 
uh, Nick, uh, Nick, Professor Nick Ries, liberation, liberation, sorry, in Japanese pronunciation, L's and R's are difficult. Um, liberation is a beautiful vision to move towards. Um, yeah, John mentioned that uh, anti doesn't articulate what we are aiming for, um, and articulation and vision uh, is needed. So in that regard, I didn't make it in the slides, but I would like to also get that out here, and I'll come back to you later. Um, get that out here that ja uh, Janet Payne's uh, book called Just Practice. I would like to suggest that uh, we for everybody, a social justice approach to social work. Um, she uh, is really, uh, she comes out of progressive social work. Uh, she's a US uh, social work prof uh, in the University of Montana, but uh, she comes out of, uh, she recommends um, uh, meaning, context, power, history, possibility as key context, concepts. And meaning could have metaphors and different kinds of uh, as meanings are context dependent has flexibility and room for different meaning systems. Um, and uh, seven core principles includes engagement, teaching, learning, action, accompaniment, evaluation, reflection, celebration. And uh, she incorporates popular education principles and uh, aspects of creativity, play, and so forth. So, um, and my, so when I, so I have known her work, uh, she's one of my mentors over the years, but uh, when I think more about it, um, this type of should have been more just practice oriented, and I need to rethink uh, my work through that lens and sort of reorient it uh, from that as well. But sort of coming back to my talk itself, um, and Uzo, resonating with Uzo's presentation as well, um, I also come from Japan where uh, American and British influence was big, and I studied social welfare in bachelor's and master's degrees, where I got really frustrated with the Western influence on uh, social work in Japan, social welfare in Japan, um, because social work profession uh, needs to uh, work within a state system, like legal system, social service system, and so forth. However, the models that are introduced in schools often come from Britain or the U US. Um, so those things don't match with each other. So we learn about social systems from within and then models from outside and they don't meet, they don't meet eye to eye. So in my undergraduate practicum, the first day, which was a sort of a, a long-term child welfare institution, um, the supervisor told me, uh, you just you just forget about everything you learned at school. Just start from scratch, is what I was told. Um, and that's how uh, many social workers on the field coped with imposition of Western-based social work approach. And which then is the value, what is the value of studying social work? It's just getting the degree and we get that seal of approval. So um, that kind of, and then that sort of a confusion, also I was not um, a serious student in other graduate years. I didn't, I was not really stimulated in my thinking. So I didn't skip school often, um, just did volunteer work with um, people, um, the kids who had severe disabilities and their families who were doing advocacy work and that was far more stimulating and interesting. Um, and, uh, and toward the end of my grad undergraduate years, um, that uh, practicum got so interesting that I thought, you know, maybe I should give it a try again. So I thought I should go to master's program to uh, give it a try again. Uh, only to find out in master's program, um, everybody else who studies so much more and worked like 10 years outside were coming into master's program. So I was like, oh, I was not, I was the one who didn't study. So then I had to really catch up. And then I thought I was, I didn't study so much. That's why I didn't understand social work. And in my master's in Japan, I understood that confusion was not mine. Confusion was in the field of not, not uh, knowing how to deal with 
uh, cultural imperialist uh, imposition from the West. Um, I would say that it was imposed forcibly, necessarily. It was both um, people willing to go and get it and wanted to use it, and partly imposed from the US. US. So both, um, both worked in that way. Um, so that led me to go to the US to study. I wanted to study cultural psychology and social both to look at uh, what the universal universal uh, universality of social work is, if there's any, and what are the cultural specifics of social work. Um, we got into studies uh, social work and social psychology and cultural psychology, and explore that like self determination. Is it uh, universal? Is there a universal process of self determination? Consent process. Um, when in Japanese social work, community or family may be the unit of analysis, not individuals, then can consent process be the same? So those are kinds of questions I carry to my uh, graduate studies in the U.S., um, which I still carry, actually. <laughs> um, then uh, the more I study, the more I realize that I don't have the answer for this. If there are confusions are out there and you have to still keep creating answers with the people who are working in the field. So that's where I'm at. And now I'm in Canada for the past 15 years. Um, and uh, as an immigrant working in the field of uh, immigration primarily for the past 15 years, but also worked in different kinds of social inclusion issues, uh, marginalization, anti-oppression, um, and uh, I didn't see so I, that's where I start. So I do have agenda, which may not say anything, but introduction. That was an introduction. And <coughs> I have a little bit of asthma, and I cough, and this is not contagious. <laughs> So what is this? Uh, 150, and Nick also mentioned this earlier, and the room full of critical social workers. What does this mean? Um, <laughs> uh, this is from the state, so uh, state as in uh, country. So I appropriated it, and you probably saw the one that's upside down, 150, um, colonial, sort of uh, challenging Canada 150 from colonial lens anti colonial lens, um, and that may be fringing on copyright issues. I didn't use that, but <laughs> imagine that also in your head. <laughs> and you, some of you might have seen it, and some uh, somebody over the dinner, I think it might have been Brenda, said that in, my, uh, in Moncton too, there are many uh, Syrian refugee families that are settling in. In and uh, also in Fredericton, there are refugee families that have been used at that general and um, settling in how many families? 104. 104 families settling into Fredericton. That's amazing. So, this had this had become a social phenomenon across Canada refugees encounter foreign wars welcome. Uh, so, this is New York Times article. Uh, that was published in July 1st, early 2016. Um, if you go to their website, you can see more pictures and stories. Um, and this 2015 was the time when Alan Hardy, remember him, the little boy who was washed up in the shore, and that galvanized the war to look at the Syrian refugee issues. Like, oh, we can't ignore that anymore. All these numbers are coming out. But we couldn't even wanna ignore that anymore because this little boy who looked like my grandson or my child is now being washed up. Um, so, and but then by this time, uh, Europe was starting to walk away from the table. Like uh, you're tired, you can't you can't keep accepting refugees anymore. And then here comes Canada, still standing strong, accepting refugees looking like a star. U.S. not accepting 
many at all. So, um, and so Canada was presented as a really welcoming country. And it is, it is a welcoming country. And I would like to say that I'm gonna say critical things about Canada, and I'm an immigrant, and I'm a permanent resident, and my son is a, a Canadian citizen, and I'm proud to be here, and and I am very happy to, I, I respect Canada so much that I get to say critical things, and then I don't have to watch my back, that you know nobody's ushering me out from airport. You know, they won't come after me just because I said something critical about Canada. And it, within that freedom, I wish with that with my wish, do all my due respect, I would like to put forward my critique, critique to the Canadian government and the system. And thank you for participating and listening to this as well. That as about me as an immigrant um, talk about this. So Trump's executive <laughs> order. Were you, were you expecting to see his picture? <laughs> you know what this is. Yeah. And this has been contested in Supreme Court. Um, it's been up there. And you also know this. Canadians feel welcome in Trudeau tweeted right after. To those fleeing persecution, terror, and war, Canadians feel welcome in regardless of your faith, diversity is our strength. January 28, 2017. So this was the same day. After this signing of this, then he went right out here. It put that to the uh, January 20th. And then he went also, again, check out tweet, welcome to Canada, like hashtag welcome to Canada on top of that. So then Americans like, wow, what a nice country Canada is. True. And then all these Americans started thinking more about coming to Canada. This is, you know, after uh, Trump was elected, the wave of interest in coming to Canada. This is another interest in coming to Canada. Um, what am I going to say after this? <laughs> so this is all true. Um, and immigrant population by selective place of support 2016 census. This just came out. Um, and uh, this is Toronto. <laughs> this much is Toronto. So, vast majority of, like, largest portion of immigrants live in Toronto, which is 3.7 million people live in Toronto. Um, and uh, Ontario, in total, 3.85 million people. So, quite a bit. To New Brunswick, 33,780 people, immigrants, to New Brunswick in 2016 census. Um, but, word to Canada, the quite a bit of people, this is an amazing number. I come from Japan, this will never, never happen. And also another thing to point out, this is East Asia. So lar um, the largest proportion come from East Asia and India, Philippines, uh, accumulatively. And Canada has discussed as a land of immigration by the government. More than 70 million people have come to Canada as immigrants since 1867. You know what that is? Uh, 2014, 26,000 foreign-born individuals were admitted to Canada. That's the immigrant number as population. Um, in 2011, 20.6% of Canada's total population were born outside of the country. Uh, Toronto, half of Toronto's residents are foreign-born. So this probably you have heard, but you know this already. So uh, you, as critical social workers, you, your uh, alarm goes up. Canada as a land of immigrants, immigration. And I probably don't have to explain this. Um, is it, so that discourse negates, omits the presence of 
uh, and ongoing colonization of indigenous peoples. And also um, neglect the kinds of difficulties and discrimination that immigrants continue to face. Um, and over here, I would like to emphasize that welcoming refugees, Syrian refugees, that is true, that's happening, and that's not what I'm trying to criticize. That is happening, and that has happened, that's continued to happen, um, and that has been very wonderful. And many people, service providers, have hard talking, individuals I have hard talking, I have friends who have sponsored, uh, in the group, they went they went backwards to sponsor Syrian families because they were they felt they had to do something. Those are all true, and they did that as they were not asked to do it. They did it as uh, individuals, like responsibility, a civic responsibility. Those are all true, and that is not that's not going to be reduced any at all from what I'm going to talk about. But I would like to challenge the discourse of land or immigration that is put out by the government because that was out different kinds of things that um, are being that is rendered invisible underneath. So, have, um, have, have how many of you have heard the term Canadian experience when it comes to immigrants? Sometimes uh, soft skills are talked about. This is from Tagore. Um, this is cut out, but it says foreign professionals need soft skills to find success. Uh, does anybody know what soft skills are? What are the soft skills? Did you not in the back? Oh, you the no, the woman in the very back. Soft skills, interpersonal skills? Yes, that's right. Yeah, so this Calvary Herald said foreign professionals need soft skills to find success. Um, and this uh, black person's smiley face is on it. Um, so that's one example. Soft skills are part of Canadian experience. I'm going to get to that. So just hold that thought. Should you have people at the office? Canadians don't. From the start, results from a new survey show the majority of marketing and advertising executives across Canada discourage full body contact displays of affection. So this is a kind of soft skill. So this is an example of soft skill. So immigrants really need to know this kind of thing, or else you won't get a job or get promoted, or else you cannot be a manager, for God's sake, right? Um, and this is the kind of thing that get into media discourse. So who feeds into media? Is the media anomaly or media reflects the kinds of things people are thinking? <coughs> Probably a latter. So with that assumption, we have done the media uh, analysis, discourse analysis of media of seven years from Toronto Star, Global Mail, National Post, um, of the time, years that uh, Stephen Harper, Harper was in office, um, and consistently um, this Canadian experience discourse um, had this kind of stuff. So I'm going to also get into that more as well. What is Canadian experience? Canadian experience requirement is often imposed on immigrants as an employment barrier. Canadian experience is often ambiguous with no clear definitions, but often used to exclude immigrants from employment. For example, not having soft skills, interpersonal, which is interpersonal skills to operate smoothly in Canadian workplace culture. Another flap here, what is Canadian workplace culture? Um, you know, many of us who came from um, Toronto and Ontario have been mentioning Oh, it's so nice to be here in Fredericton and have time to talk with each other and 
Um, so workplace culture may be different from place to place, perhaps, you know, sector to sector, perhaps, but uh, it, these things are essentialized. Um, and, uh, and somehow, immigrants are the only people who don't know Canadian workplace culture, the Canadian place, workplace culture, and all the Canadian boards are supposed to know what it is, it's how it's presented. Canadian experience barrier considered a key issue for immigrants, leads to unemployment and underemployment. Uh, a palatable way to discriminate immigrants within Canadian multicultural culturalism and inclusion ideology. So how it goes is, is, is that, oh, you applied? Uh, well, you know, you have a good resume and a good work experience. Uh, you're nice, you know, really nice. Why you're really nice, but you don't really have Canadian experience. I'm so sorry, I can't hire you. So that's how it goes. Um, and first mention of Canadian experience in print media actually comes from 1978. Mrs. Shear, a very insightful person from Burlington, Ontario. I'm a recent immigrant to this country who is undergoing the path pain of obtaining permanent employment here. I have applied for and called in response to many job advertisements, but I'm confronted with only one question. What's your Canadian experience? I wish someone would be kind enough to tell me what this Canadian experience is and how I get it without being given the chance. Is this a subtle form of discrimination? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she got it. She got it then. Have things changed? A little bit, but probably not much. So that's, yeah. Period. Um, it's an illusive concept, um, institutional, it's, and the, the thing is that it's been institutionalized in Canadian immigration policy since 2008 under uh, Stephen Harper, Jason Kenney as an immigration minister. Canadian experience was introduced as new pro program to set immigrants based on Canadian experience. Um, and also August, since August 2012, the Federal Skill Worker Program was revised and now includes Canadian experience as a selection criteria. So having lived in Canada and worked in Canada, studied in Canada is a valid selection criteria. So Canadian experience consists of hard skills, which are credentials and experiences. Hard skills will get you to the interviews. Soft skills are demonstrated in the interviews and will get you your job. Soft skills are often unspoken, learned tacitly, like tacit knowledge, um, planning, 1966, and therefore hard to obtain. Some examples include appropriate small talk and proper body language. So how do you talk? Looking at a person's eyes when they're speaking. Coming from Japan, looking at people's eyes when they're speaking. Speaking is very difficult. You have to look up, to look down, and avoid eye contact at all, you know. Um, and it's such uh, effort to look into people's eyes when I'm talking. And I'm not the only person. Um, I hear some, you know, maybe this is a stereotype, but some, um, some people from indigenous backgrounds might have similar um, cultural um, traits as well. No. Um, so then again, the question is, uh, and also it's talking at water cooler or you know what to say when people say, "How are you?" Do you spill your life story? Actually, my father has depression, and do you spill that story or um, fine? Thank you. Before you, you know, just keep on going, and you don't even listen to what the other person is saying. It's just that it just means hi. So that's something you decode, and you don't engage in real conversation when somebody says, tells you, how are you, unless that person is a friend and has actual time to engage with you. So that's sort of a coded thing that you don't, but you may not come from that kind of background. And then when, and when you ask, how are you, and you have five minutes conversation, like, oh, she doesn't have three minutes, she doesn't know what to say. Oh, I'll stay away from her. I don't have the five minutes. <laughs> also, this is a media project. Uh, um, Canadian experience, one of the things Canadian experience does is a sort desirable immigrants. 
successful immigrants, humble immigrants, and unlucky immigrants. We don't like complaining immigrants. Those are trouble. <coughs> you know, we only want successful immigrants, humble immigrants, unlucky. Thank you, Canada, for accepting me. I'm forever grateful. Um, we taught, we, we find it unlucky immigrants to try and try and go into hardship uh, for uh, Canadian workplace culture. Then there's a the Canadian workplace culture. How you behave in the world of information technology in India is very different how you, from how you behave in the world of IT in Toronto. It tends not only to be language training, but also has a large cultural component elements. Many immigrants entering the Canadian business world either come across as too aggressive or if they come from a part of the world where they are more restrained in their interaction, they can appear to be wimps. So, um, what do you do? Um, Darius Jim, Mr. Lee feels helpless. All the local companies repeatedly emphasize Canadian experience. He cannot even find entry level jobs. Then, how can he gain Canadian experience? He has attained job search workshops attend job search workshops, but they only all point to no work means no Canadian experience. No Canadian experience means no job. So Canadian experience is a sorting tool. You gotta be flexible, independent, but what is it? So with that, there's a passion component, unconsciously experienced, um, and with that in mind, um, and when we asked what, what is Canadian experience, we got we went to the end. So so there are some soft skills and hard skills and so forth. But what are you really looking at? Um, people didn't want to say or couldn't say. It. So we turned to arts-based research um, and worked with Jessica Bloor, who worked in Montreal, um, Concordia University in that. Uh, a drama therapy department, uh, and Matthew Tink, who's at Fordham University, among others, and uh, three of us worked closely together to come up with arts based focus groups using drama therapy and uh, theory of the oppressed techniques to tap into the meanings of Canadian experience. And uh, yeah, Jessica trained at Augusto Boal, uh, she has a Virginian background. For research, you use various art forms to generate knowledge in any parts of uh, research. Uh, and maybe interview consultations that is, and focus groups and participate observation, literature reviews. Um, and there are different uh, activities we have used, and these pictures show some of them. Um, one of the activities we used. Um, Props, lots of props, lots of objects in the room, and asked the uh, participants who are job seeking immigrants, these are skilled immigrants, job seeking skilled immigrants from different countries, um, or mentors uh, who are mentoring skilled, new, new skilled immigrants. These mentors are also immigrants, all the immigrants themselves who have stable jobs. Um, and they, we ask them, what is Canadian experience or what is Canadian workplace culture? So we ask them to use materials to represent them. So, um, is this a beam? No. I don't think so. Okay. Imaginary beam going up there. <laughs> Uh, this is the Canadian workplace culture um, that of Canadian experience. So, and we, so we, for example, there are eight people participating in it, and each person constructs these images. And we had, and before the artist, it's a collaborative process, no right or wrong answers. And we have lots of warm ups before we, they did these activities. and. Uh, and before the artist spoke about what they have done, we asked each person to, or uh, group to also offer their reactions to, reflections to uh, each piece. So for this, the group mentions, 
oh, it's like a time bomb. It's going to go up anytime because, you know, as immigrants, we are so stressed that we want, we feel like we're going to explode anytime now. Um, it, she is ticking, ticking, you know, it's going to go off. Um, and so other people are just, yeah, yeah. So they will just, uh, it's, it's like focus group process or group work process, you know. Uh, and the artist explained that, you know, this is the knowledge. Uh, or, or, or that somebody else goes, you know, knowledge, you know, we, we want to have knowledge, but uh, this important knowledge in the office are locked away, and they don't want, Canadian borns don't want to share that with us. And it's locked away, and they don't want to share the lock with us, so we don't know what's going on and how to access that. Um, and the artist goes, you know, actually, it's about money. Money is so tight, and every single penny you have to really hold on to. And we, we, we can't really spare any penny because we are, share, we are say, uh, spending life savings um, and uh, taking up the menial uh, labor to support ourselves until we get meaningful job. Um, and this is also about Canadian workplace culture. Um, <coughs> this is by a mentor, a Canadian board mentor actually, and said that it's like, it's like a uh, gossip. There's a gossip in the office, and there's a horse mob, and it's like inhumane sometimes. And there's a sharks out there. You have to be what you have to watch out, and you have to sort of accessorize yourself with the scarf, and you can have a little bit of feather, um, uh, and you can have a little bit of button, but you have to contain it. You can't have too much of uh, political statements. You, you said your button's okay, but not a lot. Uh, multi crosswords you can have different colors in office, but it's contained. And uh, this is uh, immigrant journey, um, arriving, there's lots of interesting stuff, but then from there, honeymoon period after that, you have to carve out your path with the knife, and you have to find your helpers along the way. Without these helpers, you can't uh, continue. And then you might go this way, that way, and eventually with the tools you find, you go this way and that way, and eventually you get there. And with the marbles, you get you get the goal with the marbles. And this is the uh, sort of uh, acting. She's acting upon, acting on a Canadian newcomer who's do who's uh, put interview job interview. He is wearing something that doesn't fit in the office culture, uh, color of his home country, country, and trying to put on the interview face, but um, doesn't know what to do. It, it, so he can be in, impersonal, but doesn't know how to show. And but it's showing his colors are showing in a, what is seen as an inappropriate way. And he is supporting, this is a rubber duck he's holding. He's supporting his family, so he really needs to get a job. And he's very nervous whether he can get this job or not. Um, there's a mask that they painted. Um, and so one mask, this is from different groups, but one is Canadian boss. So this is rather the non Canadian bosses, this was more of a Joker from Batman kind of a Canadian boss. Um, one eye is closed, one eye is open, only one eye is open, and in uh, there was even key in his head, he says, Do you have Canadian experience? Question mark, three question marks, and lots of questions in his head, even before asking questions. So that's what they job. These are newcomers going through interviews. Um, this person was um, a woman from India. Um, she was a teacher, a constructed desk. She says she has to be, um, she has to present herself as blonde, blue eyes to be accepted and get a job successfully. You can't say it well, but half her face has, half her head has black head, hair, and half her head has brown hair. And this is black, this is blue, and it's just windy. Um, and she feels like she needs to present as a white person in order to get to the job. 
And this one is a collective work done by a group. Um, and there's a, there's a frog in the throat, so they can't speak. Um, the uh, idea is stuck in the throat, can't really speak. Eyes are bulging out um, and can't really, uh, it's so, so much stress that eyes are popping up and so much stress that there's a wrinkle in the forehead and there are uh, uh, sweats coming up. And there are so many brilliant ideas in the head, in his head, in their head, that there are stars, right, pins in the head, but, but it's not coming up because the frog in the throat. It's a stressful situation, it can't come up. And, you know, it's, it's, I can't do this. So these are depictions of the stressful job search process. So that's the image of this is my thumb. How many years ago? Two years ago. And this is the person acting. So after they, they this is their own imaging of the new immigrant going through job interview process. He's a mentor. By the way, they, these are people who gave consent to be pictured and put on these presentations and found that um, me using the pictures in presentations and such. Uh, he's a stably employed person as a mentor. Uh, he is a mentor also, um, and he's playing the uh, employer. Yeah, so with that kind of data together, um, and also with the media data, we put together a verbatim theater um, with some creativity in it to put together a script reader's theater. So uh, it's called the Theater of Canadian Experience, Canada's Next Newcomer Professional. I'm going to play a little bit of segments just so to give you an idea. two different occasions and conferences that we organized. Small talk, 
You know, there's more, more to it, but I'm going to go back to the slides. Um, so the second person who has spoken now is, I don't want your social assistance. Um, she just wants to contribute to the society with the skills we have. So that's what many um, immigrants say. I, I just want to work, and I just want to use my skills. Um, and, you know, that's, that's sort of a gap that they often feel when they immigrate. So um, I think some of the senior refugees are expressing that as well. So some, um, some of the news coverage I see also discuss uh, Canadian experience. So once language issues are settled, so that issue will probably come up more. Um, readers, uh, so um, B, she uh, is a, was an MSW student, um, and these are research participants. Uh, who for was a job seeking research participant and uh, he's a mentor and she was a research assistant uh, who also have an immigrant background and she was a research coordinator for this project and uh, person who say um, Canada's uh, newcomer professional first person that she's a uh, semi professional actor so we have a professional person and Jessica Bora, who as a collaborator um, directed this play. Both so Matthew and another collaborator, Matthew and Jessica, wrote the play out of all the transcripts and the data we have. And then Jessica directed the play, and uh, the actors are mostly research participants or research assistants, people who know the issues really well.
Um, so first, yeah, people out there. Most part, but when we present it to the employers, um, they we also have the segment about masks um, that people have to wear the mask to uh, get through interviews, and uh, mostly immigrant friendly audience loved it. Uh, they they thought that they captured the idea, but the employers and politicians and bureaucrats, the audience. Did not like that, and the masks. They thought like everybody has to mask. Wear the mask when you work. What are you talking about? You have to assimilate. You have to adjust to the new culture. So they thought that that was going too far. So we have theorized that uh, through a lot of the mapping now, and that paper just got accepted. So hopefully that's it's going to come out next year. But uh, we thought that we are playing when we are doing arts-based theater. So theater based work in research. We are playing with aesthetical distance. So theater works in this because theater or any arts presentation will give you enough distance from the issue. So it makes it palatable to witness the social issues that, are, that we care about. However, masks, sometimes, sometimes they uh, depend on the audience they, uh, that distance becomes too close, too invasive. Then audiences just run away, then that play doesn't become effective anymore. So I think that's what happened with employers, because the use of masks and say that immigrants feel the need to assimilate in order to get the job was too strong of a message and they didn't like it. However, um, we didn't want to conclude that, therefore, that was not a bad idea. That was a bad idea to include it, because we don't know, we didn't do a longitudinal evaluation of the people who came to see the play. So maybe they didn't like it first, but they that if they had a strong reaction, it might have stayed with them and made them think. Maybe a year later, maybe they have different ideas about it. So we don't know what that impact was. And maybe maybe it stayed not liking it and they would uh, not they would discard the idea of community experience that year altogether, or maybe they'll rethink a year later, two years later, or maybe three months later. We don't know that. So that's something that um, it would be nice for us to look into in the future. But aesthetic distance is the idea that a theater-based, uh, research-based theater, um, in using research-based theater, uh, we are playing with, and I think was useful um, in, in this work. So then, uh, I so you just, we are really lucky in that Ontario Human Rights Commission was already starting the process of looking into this idea of Canadian experience being used to discriminate immigrants, and uh, I happened to be uh, in, looking into this issue for a few years, and then we were doing this as a collaboration at that time. So then I got called on to expert sort of consultation process, and then the coalition already going on at that time. Um, we just did this um, the theater uh, presentation the day before they called me. Um, so materials are ready. So then we were able to go along with that consultation process all the way, uh, looking at their drafts um, and supporting them to release these statements a year to later, two years later. So that was really helpful. Was, it felt really good timing. Um, they, what does this means is that strict use of the term Canadian experience in job, strict, strict requirement of Canadian experience in uh, a job or accreditation is considered discriminatory in light of Ontario Human Rights Code. So accreditation means so like there are colleges, 35 or so colleges, like architects, engineers, uh, social workers, nurses, teachers, and so forth. So if you have Canadian experience as a requirement for you to be accredited as one of the professions, professionals, then that is that these colleges needs to come, 
needs to be ready to be um, brought against the Human Rights Tribunal. Uh, same claim goes to employment. So if um, that job requires Canadian experience as a strict requirement without uh, justifiable reason, then that is considered discriminatory. The weakness in this is that the onus is on the person who believed to be believed to have been discriminated against to bring the case into Ontario Human Rights Tribunal. Therefore, and so when you think about it, when you are rejected in the job on the account of Canadian experience, one, how do you prove it? Two, if, and can you say that's the only count, the reason why you are rejected um, against this you know, compared to person B who got the job? And is that the only difference between you two? How can you tell if you're rejected? You don't get the letter explaining why you're rejected. And so how can you tell? And two, if you are rejected on the council of Canadian experience, likely you are new or immigrants looking for jobs. So you don't have the kind of time or money to spend and waiting for that process to happen. So it's a very uh, tall order. However, what is helpful is that there's an authoritative text, legal text that exists in Ontario. So, um, for example, um, many major companies, when this was released, human, right, human resource professionals um, have the trainings after trainings. Like, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> you can't use this term anymore. What are we supposed to do? So they have to change the hiring practices if they, they hadn't already. Some of the big banks had already stayed away from using the term Canadian experience, but others hadn't. So they were trying. They tried. They quickly moved away from using the notion of Canadian experience. However, at the same time, use of Canadian experience uh, is sub supported by the underlying racism, xenophobia. So if you want to say you don't have Canadian experience, Charmaine, that um, motivation comes from the idea that Charmaine is not really Canadian. Canadian. I don't like her. I don't like how she behaves. I don't like how she walks. That's really racist sentiment I have. So, you know, if that goes unchecked, it would come up, oh, she doesn't fit in a group culture. You know, so it would come up in other ways. So it's a, uh, you know, so that you come up in different uh, ways of expression. So um, that's going to be a problem, and you have to change the um, teach the discourse, changing discourse to police it, perhaps. But at the, you know, at, at the least, there's something that says on the counts of race and all these counts, this is not allowed. This is discrimination. And this was the first in Canada and other provinces. After this, I was look, looking into that. I know that Quebec was looking into that. I know other provinces are looking into that, so I don't know if other provinces move to that place to actually making the policy. Um, but still, um, it's 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 a good move as opposed to not having it at all, because it was hard to actually call it discriminatory. Because even among immigrant activists, even um, there are some people I talked to who said, you know. Immigrants need Canadian experience. There are people who say that. And within immigrant communities, there are people who look at their own people, their own co-nationals, and say, you know, those fresh off the board uh, boats, you know, they're making us look bad. They should assimilate more quickly, right? So there will be that force of always operating. Like, I, I confess, you know, I'm from Japan, and I go into Japanese a store or something, and I look at other Japanese uh, people who just got here recently, and I'm like, oh, they don't, do, they don't do that here. You know, there's an like, art that I want to tell them, no, 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 you don't do that here. And then I, I have to step back, oh, what am I thinking? Like, what am I? So, yeah, those things need to be checked. And what is allowed, what's not allowed, what, how, to what extent you have to, immigrants have to adapt. Um, so, those things. And I don't, I still, 
I'm not still opposed to having Canadian experience as a, a requirement. It's 100% opposed. However, this uh, motivation to want immigrants to adapt to Canadian society, culture and society, how much is what uh, required? I think that's up for debate, for larger debate. Okay, the discussion. So, um, the larger issue is that Canadian experience uh, is also used in popular media. Actually, when we looked for um, me media articles, um, majority of articles that used Canadian experience as a phrase were the ones uh, that general articles, not immigrant or employment related articles. For example, in the financial meltdown in the US, um, Canadians were quite proud that Canadian financial status was much healthier than that of the US. So there are articles, uh, many, few, several articles that say US should learn from Canadian experience on financial health. Um, and so, and, or there will be uh, Canadian experience on winter sports. So, um, in Canadian experience, maybe going to Tim Hortons and order double double. Uh, you know, uh, playing hockey in, on the street in winter. So those are, what is that? It's a Canadian identity. What makes Canada as Canada? Remember beer commercial? I am Canadian. So that's sort of a, oh yeah, that's like, that makes us Canadian. Makes us Canadian. Uh, winter Olympics um, in Vancouver. Also, there are uh, rants about, uh, like, uh, I am Canadian like rants in the uh, closing ceremony in Vancouver Olympics as well. So there are, so Canadians are certain, I mean, any nation, there's a national identity issue. So what makes Canada as Canada? There's an inclusive identity. There's a multiculturalism, immigrant-friendly Canada. So those are part of that. Polite, we are friendly. Um, and I'll say we, as uh, immigrants, um, but also, when we say Canadian experience, you don't have Canadian experience, therefore you don't belong here, is the underlying message that's sent out to immigrants. Then, in fact, the Canadian experience, when you say double double, or you know, street hockey in winter, those are Canadian experience, so as, you know, assimilated immigrants. Then, like where do you draw the line? So these identities always need the other to juxtapose to. Do immigrants have to pay their dues to become Canadian? If so, what are they? So the idea is that uh, immigrants, so it seems that by uh, analyzing Canadian experience media, uh, media on Canadian experience and uh, arts-based focus groups and talking to people and so forth, observing it seems that by obtaining Canadian experience, immigrants learn the status quo of Canada so that they know the rightful place in a new country. So they will march in. I was an engineer, successful, and I'm going to be the CEO of the new country. So they will march in and take over. But they know. Thank you so much. I just came from India. I'm going to be just sitting right here and observe what's going on. You know, so they will take up as a little place in the society and humbly come in and, and like work really hard and be successful. That's sort of the kind of immigrant we want, as opposed to sort of, I'm an immigrant, I'm going to be part of the country. You know, we don't want that kind of area immigrant. Um, we want immigrant, economic immigrant to fill in the uh, country's economic sort of um, shortage. We want brainy um, people, intellectuals, uh, human capital approach to immigration, but we don't want people to take over. Right? So we don't definitely want we don't definitely want people of color to take over the country. So Canadian experience in that way is a sorting tool. Are you humble enough now? Do you know the status quo? Are you okay now? Can you mingle with us or do you know the place in the society? Okay, then you can be here. You can sit at the table. Okay, right here. Here. No, not not the top. <laughs> so, so then, 
inclusive, so they, I think Canadian experience being used to be to exclude immigrants, I feel is very ironic because Canada Canadian experience, Canadian identity is supposed to be inclusive. So, um, and much of the Canadian identity has been constructed in contrast to what is perceived to be American, right? So major cities in Canada are the, most of the major cities in Canada in the border, hundred kilometers in the border of American states, United States. So there's always like, you know, annoying this little big brother in the south of the border, like, you know, I can't get away from him. It's just, I gotta distinguish. So when somebody like Trump comes along, oh, yay, I can be a nice guy now. Um, can we, so, um, but can we not have to exclude in order to be Canadian? Do we have an identity not to exclude Canadian? That's a theoretical and practical question. What do we want from immigrants? What do we want from fellow Canadians and us? Can we to, if we are to truly embrace immigrants as equal, what does it mean to be a Canadian? If there are, is, a bare, is there a bare minimum that immigrants have to observe in order to be accepted into the Canadian society? Like, uh, you know, sort of gender norms, um, homophobia, like, you know, these are things that come in from very practical immigrants, you know, like conservative sort of discourse. But um, within my own family, you know, have some of that. And um, so if they were to immigrate and some of the homophobic practice comes along, and ah, I don't want that either. So, but is there a bare minimum that immigrants have to observe? But we have that in Canadian boards too. Uh, is it identity or value or belief, belonging or behaviors that matters? Is it behaviors? Is it values? Is should there be uh, is it uh, is a conservative um, politician um, offering the behavior test, like a value test? Is it does it come to that? Stepping back to the bigger picture, global definition of social work profession from IFS, International Federation of Social Work and International Association of Schools of Social Work um, adopted in 2014. Social work is a practice-based profession and an academic discipline that promotes social change and development, social cohesion and the empowerment and liberation of people. Principles of social justice, human rights, collective responsibility, and respect for diversities are central to social work, underpinned by theories of social work, social sciences, humanities, and indigenous knowledge. Social work engages people in structures that address life challenges and enhance well being. The above definition may be amplified at national and or regional levels. So, some of the themes we talked about throughout this conference are articulated here as well. Um, and also taking uh, up on that legitimate dominant knowledge. So this is also theme on indigenous, indigenizing knowledge. The globalization of knowledge and Western culture constantly reaffirms the West view of itself as the central legitimate knowledge, the arbiter of what counts as knowledge and the source of civilized knowledge. This is Linda Smith, Maori, Maori woman from uh, uh, out, out to Aura, New Zealand, different ways of knowing, equalizing our knowledge base, documenting local indigenous knowledge depths, very important, and questioning what we think as common sense is very, very important. So to that end, I try to do conduct inclusive research methodologies. I uh, use inclusive, inclusive research methodologies and community-based participatory research. Um, Uzo articulated uh, the principles of some of these uh, methods, methodology, the strength of the community, and also um, Brenda talked about centering um, experience of the uh, in the back studies, uh, not people. Um, critical disability studies, also um, disabled people's experience at the center, uh, promotes the equitable involvement of all partners in the research process, and also I uh, say arts informed research for social justice, because arts expands our thinking and cuts through uh, 
counting processes and uh, let our creative process to um, uh, sort of engage different ways of solution. So I uh, really see the possibilities for that as well. In indigenous methodology, of course, decolonizing methodology and anti oppressive research, but I also look into just research, just social justice. Way, a social just way of doing research. Oh, great. Should I finish now? Maybe? Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, I just uh, mentioned that um, the lessons to be done. Um, I am a migrant and I talked about immigration. So, I uh, sounded like, you know, I know the answer and like, telling you what to do. Um, but my lessons are, you know, I, by conducting uh, community-based research, um, there are many lessons to be learned, and there are many embarrassing moments, and uh, uh, for example, fascism was something that I really learned, uh, I had to really uh, raise my consciousness around uh, by conducting research on homelessness. This is a collaborative with our eight research projects using homeless, uh, focus, focusing on homelessness, using arts, uh, working with indigenous communities. Cindy Lasky was part of that project. Um, and policy report. And difficult part was to apply ourselves to, to do that um, exhibit and write policy report. Um, our eight projects, we decided that we put our eight projects and organize our eight projects in a rotunda in the city hall um, in according to medicine wheel. So there are meanings of medicine wheel, south direction. Southern direction is, for example, we in Anishinaabe traditions. So um, my, the projects I was part of is coming together project focus on relationships. So our project was the south, southern part of rotunda in the city hall. So um, applying ourselves in the sort of uh, applying medicine wheel to ourselves. So look, often indigenous people that looked from our wisdom um, lens and pathology. So we tried to do this the other way. However, Cindy was a leading figure. So I asked uh, some of the few researchers who were indigenous. But during the summer, in a critical time, this was end of early October of that year, 2009, and Cindy was gone for the summer, as many indigenous people they go back to their own community, um, and we had to work this up. Um, and there were 19 people on the team, because there were peer researchers, community agencies, funders, some of the academics, artists, like all these people, eight projects, right, involved, and I was this lead researcher on that. And was so difficult to navigate this, the like herding cats who have different agendas, and um, there are oppositions in on the team, like, you know, we can't do this. Like, you know, if we can't we offend people, offend, you know, I'm not indigenous, we are not indigenous, most of us are not indigenous, but we can't do this. And the first artist we brought on thought that, you know, Mason is not a design, you can't do this. And both that for the meaning. Um, and luckily the second artist who came, young person, was very happy to do this and that we were using it, was able to do it. But we have to navigate, we have to be our allies, so convince each other and try to make this happen. And we have a video that I can point that to you too, um, where Cindy talks about that she was gone, but we made it happen, that she was happy about that when she came back, this was up. Um, but that was a hard process and learning process for us all as well. And definitely for me, it was a huge learning process to what an ally can do and what we should, like, you know, so they're like, oh, is this, am I allowed to do this or should I be doing it? But, you know, we were able to hang on to it. So that was good. Um, and right now, I'm also looking into my own settler colonialism and uh, colonial history and so forth in my um, the current short project uh, on Japanese Canadian art activism. Um, and Japanese communities are uh, heavily intermarried and 80% intermarriage rate, um, partly or more largely because of uh, uh, 
legacy of uh, internment during World War II um, and our activism addressing internment uh, by current generation is something that I'm interested in and have an exciting team of people I'm working with. Um, and within that, you're asking difficult question of marginalization within the Japanese Canadian community and transnational relationships in the settler colonialism uh, or in the indignity of team member members and the uh, privileged positions that I pick up in the team or that inside the community, how those things play out and within the community, which voices are silenced and not. Them. So I, yeah, you're, you'll see how, and that at the end, we're gonna have case studies uh, that will result in um, graphic novels on the website. Mm -hmm. So in two years, two and a half years, hopefully, mm -hmm. it will sell for the old. Uh, and it's very important that we engage in arts ourselves to all have some fun ourselves, to have creativity, play, so that we have play space mm -hmm. in our brain uh, while, while doing the critical social work. So we can come up with Facing the right way to come up with solutions for difficult questions. So, thank you so much. Thank you.